just going to start with a, a few verses, familiar portion of Scripture. Grew up in a Christian home, you hear this first verse a lot. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, and the title of the message this morning is Dealing, Dealing with Our Defects. Uh, I, I'm a father, I, I had a father, and uh, my, my boys are now fathers, and uh, I'm well aware that every human father has some defects. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 6, uh, we'll start by reading just the first four verses. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, fatherhood, it's a big responsibility. Unfortunately, we live in a day when many men put that responsibility away, and uh, they have children, but they're not fathers, and it's a sad thing. Um, the Bible uses a couple of strong words here when he talks about fatherhood. He, one he uses in verse 2, the word commandment. Uh, we live in a day and age when people don't like being told they have to do something, but God is able to tell us to do things. And when he tells us, honor your father and mother, he says, that's the first commandment with promise. R relationship in your family. God says, very important. And then he says to the fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. We live in an angry world. I, I think as fathers in general, worldwide, we're not doing too good a job. <laughs> uh, we're not uh, following God's in instructions here. Doyla was telling me about a book she'd just read recently or looked at. And it was asking the question, do you really want your children to deal with anger the way you deal with anger? Do you really want your children to deal with money the way you deal with money? I haven't read the book, but it made me think, uh, do I really want my children to deal with me the way I've dealt with them? <laughs> you know, we need to stop and think. Fatherhood is a very important part of life. And it, it relates to our theme for the year, Thy Kingdom Come. You know, God is the king, and we need to be subject to him in this area, as well as every area. He needs to be the king in, in our home. And as fathers, as mothers, as children, uh, we need to honor the Lord. He needs to be the one who tells us what to do. God is the one who established the home and marriage. It's not something that just developed by chance. God gave uh, this thing of, of marriage. Uh, in researching subjects in the Bible... Uh, one of the things that they often comment on is the first mention. Now, I'm, I'm not exactly sure why that's important, but the first time the word father is mentioned, let me read it to you. Therefore shall a man leave his father. <laughs> that's the first thing you read about being a father. You know, one of the things we're supposed to do as fathers is to prepare our children to not need us. We're not to make them dependent on us. That's, that happens when they're children. But our goal is for them to be able to be dependent on the Lord themselves. Uh, I, I thought that, that's interesting. That's the very first mention of, of fatherhood in the Bible. And as you go through, I just put in the word father and looked at all the, the uh, references in the Bible about being a father. And let me tell you, there's a lot of bad examples of fatherhood in the Bible. <laughs> and let me mention a couple. Uh, do you remember Lot? <coughs> Lot, who went down and lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, basically lost his family. God calls him a righteous man, a just man, but he vexed his righteous soul. And let me tell you, he lost his family because of a choice he made to go for the gold instead of going for God. Uh, Abraham fathered outside of his marriage, and, and people still fight each other today because of it. Jacob he was, God changed his name to Israel. He had 12 sons, and he favored one above the others. Boy, it caused trouble. God used it for good, but uh, David, you know, David is called in the Bible a man after God's own heart. Uh, he was a, a wonderful man, but one of the things I noticed about him, uh, he had a son named Ad Adonijah, 
And it says this about him, about David in 1 Kings 1. His father, that's David, had not displeased him at any time in saying, why hast thou done so? David had never disciplined his son, Adonijah, and he raised a rebel. He raised a person who rose up against him uh, to take the kingship from him. There's many exam bad examples, and we can learn from those. But there's also some times when God says, this is what is the norm for a father. I, I found it interesting that there's, I found it at least three passages where just in passing, God mentions what it's like to be a father. It, it, the passage is not necessarily teaching fathers, but it's just saying, this is the way it is when, when you're a father. One is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. And I put this one first because it, it relates to David not disciplining his children. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 says, let, letting you find it there. With your electronic devices, you need to put in a page flutter. There you go. Hebrews 12, 7 says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Now God's not really teaching there about fathers and sons, but he's just saying, what kind of father would not chasten his son, would not discipline his son? Just in passing, he, he lets us know that's just normal. That should have been normal for King David with his sons, but he was too important to raise his sons. Yeah, sometimes we, in our importance, we forget what's really important in life. Uh, you know, your, your first goal as a father, as a parent, is not to be your children's friend. They got lots of friends. They only get one dad. You need to be their father. And I can pretty much guarantee you, if you'll be a godly father, when they grow up, you'll be their friend. I've seen people who are friends with their kids when they were little, and they grow up and they never see them again because they've alienated them. They've, they've provoked their children to anger by their lack of discipline. Uh, another passage is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I just found this interesting that there's so many, there are several passages that just in passing said, this is just a norm for, for a father. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul is, is writing to the church at Thessalonica there and, and talking about his relationship with them and comparing it to a father. 1 Thessalonians 2, 11, As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So he just says, you know, I treated you like a, like a father would, his children. And just in passing, he says, this is, this is a norm for fathers with their children. He uses three main words there, exhorted, comforted, and charged. Uh, the word exhorted means to come alongside. Well, whenever I describe the word exhorted, I always put my arm out. You, you come alongside. You encourage. We're to encourage our children. And we're not to... We're not to discourage them. We're to be on their side. And as well, he uses the word comfort, console, help them through the tough times. And then he uses the word charge. I found that the most interesting of these three words. It actually comes from the word martyr. Isn't that interesting? And what he's saying there is, you need to invest your life in your children. He's not saying just tell them what to do. He's saying, show them what to do. Live your life so that they can see in you what a godly person is like. Be an example. You know, one of, the, one of the most important things you'll say to your children, one of them, is, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Is that seven words? Seven hardest words to say. But let me tell you something. That'll help your relationship with your children. Now, God never has to say that. Uh, He's a better father than, than any of us. But God says that this is just the norm for, for dealing with kids. Um, exhort, comfort, charge. And then, then one other, Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. I always go over my sermon on, on Sunday morning again, and early. And as I was going over it this morning, I thought, this, this might be kind of a short sermon, but that'll be all right. <laughs> uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 9 
You're familiar with this passage where Jesus is saying, ask and seek and knock, and then he relates it to, to a father. What man is there of you whom, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Now he's just saying there, be kind and, and provide for your children. That, that's, that's a norm. You, you know, it's interesting that the world we live in, we've gotten away from family and church. That's God's safety net for us, folks. It's not the government. I heard someone the other day, they're having a problem, and, and, and they were saying, and it was so, it was, there, there was so little help that I had to get my mother to help me. I thought, well, isn't that the first port of call? I mean, you know, the government wouldn't help me. I had to get my mother to help me. <laughs> Folks, that's the way it should be. <laughs> a family first, then your church. Then there, you know, there's things government should do for us, but not, not most of the things. You know, we see God's, just in passing, he says, these are, are norms for the Christian home. These are norms that we can say, a father should be like this. But you know, the, the real story is often very different, isn't it? Uh, if you're out in the community much, you know that a lot of kids don't know their father. Uh, not just this country, a lot of countries. Uh, it's easy to go around having kids. It's hard to be a father, to raise those kids in the nurture and admonition of, of the Lord. Uh, we live in a world where marriage and va family is not really valued anymore. Uh, I, I looked up these statistics since 1970, Australia has doubled in population, but there are less marriages today than there were in 1970, with twice the population. 80% now live together before marriage. 80% now have a civil celebrant rather than a religious ceremony. Divorce has actually decreased. I think it's probably because most don't bother to get married. But of the children involved in divorce, this stunned me. 50% spend no nights with the non-resident parent. That's usually the dad. Father's Day. Uh, there's a lot of kids who won't see their father on Father's Day because family has, has come apart. Uh, children are not always valued. Uh, the birth rate is lower now than it has ever been. 20% of all pregnancies are aborted. Isn't that sh shocking? One out of every five children that are conceived are killed. Uh, many parents do not mother or father. But, uh, pushing that aside, even those who are wanting and trying to be the best father and mother they can be, it's still a hard job, isn't it? Uh, I mean, really, uh, that was... Uh, Doyle and I came, we're, we're foreigners, she, uh, I was telling somebody, I get asked almost every, uh, you know, where are you from? <laughs> um, our, one of our main priorities was we didn't want to serve the Lord and lose our children. And I, I felt like we worked really hard at that, to, to be good, good parents. But let me tell you, it's, it's hard. It's hard being a good parent. It, it's not... It's not a job for weaklings. Um, a few years ago, um, I received cards from each of them. We have three children. And uh, I received Father's Day cards from each one of them. And, and they were so complimentary. It, it was just uh, lo lovely. You know, they said things like, um, I love you, I admire you, I want to be like you. And it, and it really humbled me because I know the struggle I go through. I know the difficulties I have just to try and be a good man, let alone a good father. And my response was, Lord, can I just, could I possibly be that man that my children think I am? Now, not every home is gonna have that, that same situation, but you know, I live with my faults. I live with the things they don't see. And it's, it's hard being, 
doing the job that God gives you to do as, as a father. But God will help you. God will help you. You see, there's only one perfect father. It's not you and it's not me. It's, it's our heavenly father. And aren't you glad that in our failures, we have one who's underneath us. Underneath are the everlasting arms, the Bible says. Aren't you glad? Some of you, like me, you, your father's no longer with us, your, your earthly father. But listen, you have one who can make this promise, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Aren't you glad? I can't say that to my children. I could, I could die before this sermon is over, let alone before their life is over. But God can say, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You see, his character and his quality is such uh, that he's perfect. He's always loving. He's always kind. I can guarantee you, I'm not. <laughs> and I don't think you are either. Um, he's always righteous. He's eternal. He's merciful. He's powerful. He's wise. Our Heavenly Father has the character that we can rely on. And He's been involved with your life before you were born. In, in Psalm 139, He talks about His plans for you before you were even a twinkle in your parents' eyes. Uh, Psalm 139, verse, verse 14, you're probably familiar with this portion of Scripture. I will praise thee, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and furiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance being yet, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. What he's saying there is, before you even existed, God had a plan for you. God knew you by name. God, God had a, a purpose, and God had uh, a way for you uh, to know him and to have uh, consequence in your life. He's your creator. But like we looked at last week, something happened to the creation. It's called sin. And sin it came, and, and man, it, it, it put Adam and Eve out of their home. It, it brought sin and disease and death. It... it tears up our, our homes even, even today. Uh, he's our creator, but God is also our redeemer. What a blessing it is that in our sin and, and in our struggles, we have one who's made a way for us to have our sins forgiven. Let, let me read you Isaiah 44, verse 24. Just, just listen to it. Thus saith the Lord, thy redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. He puts the two together. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Now, we have a wonderful God, and he says he's not only our creator, he's our redeemer. Redeeming has to do with paying a price. 1 Corinthians 6, he says you're bought with a price. And the price is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he says, we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. There's no human physical thing that we, can, that we could pay to make us right before God. He says, but we're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. God became a man and paid the price for our sins. Our lovely Heavenly Father. Now, it's interesting. I'm just thinking about, um, is it Isaiah... Nine, yeah. When it talks about Jesus, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And it says of him, the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called, the, called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Now, even in Jesus, we have our Everlasting Father. We only believe in one God, by the way. Uh, we believe in the triunity of God. But God became a man so that we could know our Heavenly Father. And you know, the important thing is, how do I become a child of God? Uh, we were talking in Sunday school about how uh, there's some will stand before God and he'll say, I, I don't know you. In other words, you're not one with me. You're not part of my family. Uh, God says in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, that's Jesus, 
To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, the man he said that to, you can just see his face, can't you? He said, you mean I have to go back into my mother's womb? <laughs> he literally said that. And Jesus said, no, he said it's a spiritual thing. The first birth is, uh, is of water. The second birth is of the spirit. First birth is, is physical. The second birth is spiritual. And uh, as people, we're not born Christians. We're born little sinners. And we've got to be saved. And God says, Jesus used the expression, you must be born again, born into God's family. Ephesians 2, he says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, Satan takes Christianity and he turns it into religion. Yeah, there's lots of religion in the world. And lots of works that people say, well, if you just do this, maybe you'll go to heaven. God says it's not by works of righteousness which we've done. He says it's by faith in the finished work of Christ. What a blessing. Our Heavenly Father, not only our Creator, but our Redeemer. And a finished work, He presents it and He says that we can receive it as a gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I like to use A, B, C. A, we need to admit that we're a sinner and deserve to go to hell. The Bible says that's every one of us. Christianity is not proud people saying, I'm on my way to heaven. It's people, somebody said, it's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You know, we all, we've realized we're sinners and deserve to go to hell. A, admit that we're, we're sinners. B, believe the gospel. That's that Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose again. Believe that he is the redeemer. And then, and, and rose again. I need to add that. That's, that's part of the gospel. Uh, and see, call upon Jesus to save you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, what a blessing that we can know uh, the Lord. God is our Father. Uh, he's the perfect Father. And one of the things that I, I find encouraging is to realize what God says He thinks about us when we're saved, when we're his children. I'm gonna, I want to show you a few scriptures. I, I had these particularly put uh, on, a, on the screen so that you could see them. So when you get saved, when you're born again, uh, you know, there's a definite transaction. Uh, it's like a, a, a birth. If, if you've been there for a birth, uh, you know, you don't say, have you had a child? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's either there or it's not, you know. <laughs> yeah, and especially you women, you know, it, it either came or it didn't. I know some women are surprised when it comes, but uh, anyway, uh, there's a definite transaction that, that takes place between you and God. And the Bible says that when you're saved, number, well, I won't number them, but it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, God sees you as in Christ. That's important. He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In Christ. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. Secondly, God sees you as his child. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. His child. And he says he might discipline you, but he'll never leave you. He'll always love you. We sang this morning, I'm a child of the King. And you know, what a wonderful thing. How God sees us. Thirdly, he sees us as forgiven. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. God sees you as forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin, the Bible says. He sees us as his temple. What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? If you're saved, God has taken up residence. Yeah, I was thinking how encouraging this is this morning. You know, why should we be depressed? <laughs> you know, stop and think about what God has done for us if we're saved. If you know Christ is your Savior. Uh, you're his temple. Romans 8, 17 says we're joint heirs with Christ. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We have a heritage. We're joint. He, he's our, what's it called? I don't know when you're, he's our, our big brother, but our joint heir. Then uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God sees us as righteous. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, another Bible word that God uses is the word justified. Justified means declared righteous. 
And what a wonderful thing it is that we're not right with God by our works. We don't work our way to God. We admit we're sinners and we receive his forgiveness and his righteousness, both the positive and the negative. God takes away our sin, but he gives us his righteousness. It's like saying, let me just put a million dollars in your bank account here. You know, he, he gives us his righteousness. Then in 1 Peter 2.9 he says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that he should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Uh, we've been set apart. We, we belong to him. That word peculiar, I think Satan likes to distort good words. The word peculiar means that you belong particularly to, to the Lord. And what a wonderful thing that is. It doesn't mean that we're odd. Now, we're odd to the world, I guess. But it means that it has to do with own your ownership. We belong to the Lord. We're his people. We're set apart. Ephesians 2.10, and we looked at Ephesians 2.8 and 9, he, he says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're his workmanship. That word is the word poem. The Greek word is poem something. Uh, God is writing the poem of your life. And listen, when it all gets done, it'll make sense. <laughs> You're his workmanship, his masterpiece. Colossians 2.10, ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You're complete in him. Yeah, a lot of people spend their life trying to fill up something they think is lacking. God says you're complete in him. Just find out what it is and, and, uh, and live it. You're whole. Galatians 5.1, he says we're free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We're free from sin. We're free to do right. And 1 Corinthians 15, 57, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these are just a selection of things, as how God sees us when we're his child. What God knows is true, that there's victory in Jesus. We don't we're not trying to win the victory. We just need to live in the victory that God has already won. See, when you get saved, God is the perfect Father. He not only loves you as you are, but He knows what He's going to do with you. He knows where you're going to end. You know, as our kids grow up, you think, ooh, what's going to, oh, how are they going to turn out? You know, we don't know, but God knows. And God has a plan for us. Let me read to you from 1 John 3 again. Verse 1 through 3, he says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And listen to this, the third verse. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. You ever seen little kids trying to be like their dad or, or their, their mom? Uh, as we see how much God loves us, and as we see what he's done and is doing, it's, it motivates us to <coughs> live for him, to be pure. Dealing with our defects. I can guarantee you, you'll have some. Um, you, know, you, you look back at, as an older person now and, you think, oh, I wish I'd have done this, or I wish I'd have done that. But uh, at the time, sometimes you don't know, sometimes you do. Uh, we'll never be the perfect father. You won't, I won't. But we can have the perfect father, and we can point our children to that perfect heavenly father. That's so important. You know, as, as men this morning, ladies, you can apply this to yourselves in, in another way, but as men, we need to be men. Don't be ashamed to be a man. I think I read earlier, 1 Corinthians 16, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong, that all your things be done with charity. Quit you like men. You know, do the manly thing. Uh, don't, don't be a, a, a quitter. Uh, be a person who, who quits like a man. Be men. Be godly. Look to God. Uh, God calls on men to be the spiritual leaders in their home. And many times we either ignore it or we push it off on our wife or, or someone else. Uh, be men. Be godly men. Look to God and point your children to God. 
Point your children to God when you succeed. Give him the glory. Point your children to God when you fail. And help them to see how to make things right with their heavenly father. Humble yourself, in other words. And God will lift you up. You know, for everyone, for every one of us, if you died today, based on the Bible, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? It's not up to us to decide how a person goes to heaven. God has decided. And he says there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's only through Jesus. I mean, theoretically, you could be the best man on the earth, and you still wouldn't be good enough to go to heaven. It's not by works of righteousness which we've done. Have you been born into God's family? That's the key. You know, as you think of Father's Day, we can be encouraged. Don't dwell on your defects. Do change them and do you know, commit them to the Lord and that, but don't, don't make that your focus. Focus on your Heavenly Father. He knows you, He loves you, and He'll help you. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, listen, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Make sure you trust Him. Let's go to Him in, in prayer this morning with heads bowed and in an attitude of prayer. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe there's an area that, uh, that God is convicting you about uh, your walk with Him or your walk with your family. or uh, Maybe this morning you need to trust Christ as your Savior. Well, listen, God is there to meet your need. And He wants you to come to Him. He made you to know Him. Father, we are grateful that you give us your word. Uh, Lord, as we see creation and, uh, and the sin that, that abounds, Lord, we're, we're grateful that where sin abounds, uh, your grace abounded more. Lord, thank you that you've made a way for us to know you. And uh, Father, I pray if there are those here this morning that are not saved, that your Holy Spirit would help them to see that they can trust Christ. Father, bless us as fathers, bless us as mothers, Help us as children to honor our parents. And uh, Lord, we commit these things to you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.